All right, Grant, we're back at it. Let's do this. <laughs> Giddy up, Buttercup. Let's go. Um, so first of all, everybody, Grant is an amazing friend. I just got done telling him pre-show that if all I did was say, tell me about your life, and then Grant talked for 40 minutes, this would be an amazing episode because uh, from my vantage point, from my seat, I am so deeply impressed with Grant, who he is as a man, how he shows up in one-to-one -one conversations in front of groups, and then with his team and his family, I wanted to get the story here of a guy who has built, in my opinion, a life that I would love to emulate pieces of in my world. So Grant, um, dude, we're about to get into the whole world of Mr. Baldwin, and I'm thrilled about this personally, but also because of the members that get to know you, and then the rest of the world that gets to know you as well. So um, let's start with an easy one, man. How are you feeling right now? Like literally in this moment, as we record at 1115 on June 21st, how are you, buddy? I'm doing great. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, the, the feeling is mutual. I know when we crossed paths many, many years ago, um, I was just like, I oh, just, you know, a good speaker, dude. And, and uh, we just resonated and kept in touch over the years. And it's been fun to, to watch each other's journeys, you know, personally and professionally. Uh, so I'm a huge Roman fan. I'm a huge FRD fan. And uh, so, yeah, I appreciate you letting me hang out with you. Yeah, l life is really, really good. Uh, I know when we hung out at the most recent uh, retreat, you know, I told you, um, that I just, I, it, it was hard for me to come up with something that like, oh man, I'm really struggling here. This is, this thing's like really kicking my butt. Um, and again, it's not that life is perfect or it's kind of this, um, you know, false narrative that I'm telling myself, but I genuinely feel like, man, marriage is really great. Kids are really great. Uh, business is really great. Uh, health I've made a lot of progress in. And so it's just like, life is really, really good. Um, and uh, again, I just, I feel very, very, very grateful for where I'm at. But I think you also know um, that it's been, you know, it's been very intentional. There's a lot of, of um, design that goes into having the, you know, the freedom and flexibility and autonomy that we, that we have in life. And that's what I want to get into. I want to go through the story because I want people to be able to see your journey and then pick out the pieces they want to emulate. You know, if there's something in there like, yes, that aligns with me, I'm going to put that into my world. Yeah. Um, so let's start with some context. Tell us who's at home. Tell us about your family. Yeah, I'm so I'm married to my high school sweetheart. Uh, we have been together for 25 years to celebrate our 20 year anniversary. Um, we have three daughters. So it's me and a house full of women. It's the absolute best. I absolutely love it. Uh, my girls are 16, 13 and 11. And uh, as much as I enjoy like being an entrepreneur, being a speaker, being a business owner, like, man, I love being husband, love being dad. Like those are the, the roles that, that really resonate with me. And I know that's you know a big part of why you and I resonate is I love business. I really, really genuinely enjoy it, but uh, I, I don't want to do that at the detriment of my roles as a, as a husband, as a dad. So um, yeah, that's, a, that's the family. Those are, my, those are my girls. And how about on the business side? What, tell, tell us what you do. I, I mean, I could do my best, but yeah, it's yeah, evolving so, for you all the time too. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I've been in the speaking industry pretty much my entire career. And so um, pre that, uh, I actually went to Bible college. I was a youth pastor for a little while at a local church that gave me a lot of opportunities to speak. Speaking is one of those things I felt like I was good at. Um, I wanted to do more of, I just, I didn't know like, how does this world work? Like, how do you find gigs and who hires speakers and what do you speak about? And how much do you charge? And how does this mysterious black box of an industry work? And so at the time, this was, you know, 16, 17 years ago, um, there wasn't a, there weren't any books, there weren't any podcasts, there weren't any like good resources on how to get going. And so I found myself just emailing other speakers, stalking other speakers. Can I pick your brain? Just being annoying and just learning something and, you know, kind of parlay that into gig after gig after gig. And so I uh, started off doing, you know, a few gigs here or there, and then got to a point where I was doing 20, 30 gigs a year. And eventually got to a point where I was doing about 60 or 70 gigs a year and had a lot of people who were asking me like, Hey, I want to be a speaker. How would I go about doing that? And so I started, a, um, this is probably seven, eight years ago or so started a, did a course and did a podcast and did some coaching and just kind of like, yeah, let me just kind of help some people on the side and quickly realized like one, this is something I really, really enjoy. And I felt like I was decent at, and two, there's a really big need. Like I felt like we were helping people who were where I was when I got started. And so then it was like, well, what if we, you know, what if we built a business around this. And so that's really evolved into what we do today. So uh, I run the Speaker Lab, which is a, a, a coaching and training company for speakers, uh, specifically on the business of speaking. Again, those, those key questions of how do you find gigs and what do you speak about? 
And that's where, you know, you and I got connected years ago is you and I were both speaking a ton and, and knew that there's a lot of people who want to do this. And it's a, um, what we always tell students is that it's simple, but it's not easy. You know, it, it requires work. It requires effort. The fun, sexy parts being up on stage, but there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes of just building the flywheel and building the business and building the momentum of it. Yeah, I was just telling Tiger this story. Uh, for those who don't know, Tiger's my 12 year old and I was in the car talking to him about, oh, so here's how it all started. Um, on Father's Day, we pulled up to a traffic light and there was a man, a homeless man, or, 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 well, a man who was begging for money and he had his son right there. Mm-hmm. And dude, I am- almost immediately started crying. I, 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 and, and I reached, I said, Come, hey man, I waved him over and I handed him, uh, I handed him a hundred dollar bill wow. and the kids saw this. And that prompted a conversation. Uh, and I never do that, by the way. I don't hand out $100 bills like that. But in this moment on Father's Day, watching this man there with his son, uh, I handed him a $100 bill. And the kids were like, that's a lot of money. And I was like, it is a lot of money. And then they got into the question about having money. And I, I said, I want you guys to know that when you were born, Tiger, I was I was starving, <laughs> trying to pay the bills and didn't yeah. have a hundred dollars to my name. And I, I talked to him about the, the growth of the business. Um, and, you know, starting out young, you and I in this business working hard to get it going. You, I don't know, I, I've told you this, I think, but we were at an event together. Um, you were sitting next to me at dinner and I had learned that your business just did seven figures. And I remember feeling like you and I were in the speaking business together. I was multiple six figures at that point, but to hear a buddy, uh, a guy, a, 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 you know, and say his business was about to do seven. I don't know if you know this, but you really opened up my mind to what was possible in building a business. And that's what I want to talk about today is, is opening up the minds of maybe some of our listeners to what's possible when you go from, you know, the, I work a lot to put food on the table, to leveraging yourself, uh, learning. And that's something you do really well, by the way, I want to give you a compliment here. I think you're great at asking for help, reaching out, looking for the resources boldly. And that's to my In my viewpoint, that's been one of the things that's helped you. But let's talk about this. Give us, if you can, the the big journey and take your time to unpack this. But how did you go from the speaker, if we look big modular pieces of it, to where you are today? And then let's drill into some of the specifics of that. Yeah, I can give you a couple of just milestones along the way. Um, And I I think one thing that you kind of touched on there that has been really, really pivotal for me and and something that I still really believe in today is to look for someone who is a who is where you are or or, uh, who is a step or two ahead of where you want to be and being able to just kind of reverse engineer. And some of it is just like the practical thing of like, okay, what steps did you take? Let me kind of figure that out. But then some of it, like you said, some of it is just the mental part of like, Oh, I could do that. I just had in my mind, it was way more difficult. But now that I saw you do it, that again, not like in a, a, a negative or mean way, like, well, if that joker can do it, then I, this clown can do it. Like, no, no, like it just helps you to realize it's like that, that uh, analogy and story that's told oftentimes about the four minute mile. Like once one person does it, well, then a bunch of other people think, well, okay, well now I understand that it's possible. And that was definitely the case for me. So for example, early on for me with speaking, uh, because I had come from the church world primarily as a speaker, I did a lot of speaking on a weekly basis to students. And so I was comfortable speaking, but I was like, how does that translate to like a school assembly or to a conference? Like, how does that work? And uh, there was a, a guy I'd reached out to, Josh Ship, uh, who's a successful youth speaker, reached out to him. He was doing an event a couple hours away from me. I drove up to meet up with him, had, had dinner with him, saw him speak. And it was just like, okay, now I get it. And it's just kind of like this aha, this click, like I could do that again, not in a cocky, arrogant way, but it just felt a, a level of confidence of like, okay, now I, it, it opened my mind to what was possible. Um, and, and as a random side note, like that event where I saw him speak, like I was hired to speak at that a few years later. And so it was just kind of like this full circle moment. So that was a big deal for me. Another one um, early on was uh, when I got to a point where I was doing about 60, 70 gigs a year. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun, but as you well know, the nature of speaking is 
uh, it is a high paying manual labor job in that you get paid really, really well to stand on stage and run your mouth, but you have to get on a plane, you have to leave your family, you have to go somewhere. And, you know, sometimes like travel can be really, really fun. It can be really cool. You get to see, you know, you and I have seen a lot of parts of the country that most people would never get a chance to see in their lifetime. But there's also like the, the downside uh, of just a non-glamorous, non-sexy part of travel, uh, in addition to just being away from home and being away from the family. So I quickly realized like, I don't have a business. Like I, I have a job. It's a cool job. It's a fun job, but it's, it's nonetheless a job. And when you have a job, there is just a cap. There's a limit. And so I quickly realized like, in order to make more, I either have to do two things, either I have to do more gigs and I was already doing a lot of gigs. I wasn't trying to do more, or I had to, I think you ran into this as well. I had to like completely switch industries and kind of go to uh, further upstream and go to more of a corporate type world. And I just wasn't, that wasn't super in intriguing, appealing to me. And so I remember feeling just kind of like stuck. And there are people that, that you and I know in the speaking world who they are speakers, they've been speakers, they will be speakers the rest of their lives. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. And so I remember I was doing a gig in Reno and there's a, a speaker friend of mine. He's probably, you know, 20 years older than me. And he's a guy that I've always kind of looked up to as a, as a mentor type figure. And so I met up with him and I'm, I'm just telling him, I'm, like, I just, I feel stuck. And there's a couple of things he said to me. He said, one is you want to regularly find things where the challenge exceeds the skill set. Meaning like when you and I first got into speaking, uh, the challenge exceeded the skill set. We felt way over our head, you know, and there's that nervous there. There's that anxiety. But what happens is over time, you and I have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigs to the point that it flips and the skill set exceeds the challenge. Meaning you and I could stand in front of a thousand people right now. We could give our keynote and we could crush it. And yet internally, we could be on autopilot. We could be bored. We could just be going through the motions because the skill set exceeds the challenge. And so he said, what you regularly have to do is you have to find things where the challenge exceeds the skill Set. I'll give you a quick example. Like right now at this moment, I don't remember if I told you this, I just started taking flying lessons. And I saw a I, picture of that. Yeah. I've, I've always just kind of been intrigued by it. There's no like practical need to do it other, other than just like, oh, that seems kind of cool. I've been on a lot of planes. Like what's it like up front? And so literally uh, just had my first lesson this past weekend, got a lesson tomorrow. And so right now at this moment, the challenge way exceeds the skill set. You know, when you are you are sitting there in the cockpit and you're just like, holy crap, this is intense, right? But what happens is over time, like the, the skill set exceeds the, the challenge. And that's where crashes happen as people get comfortable, right? And so at that moment in my career as a speaker, I just kind of felt like in that space, in that bubble, like especially like in the education market, I'd done a lot of the major events. I keynoted a lot of the, the large conferences. Like I just checked a lot of the boxes. And so it's kind of like, well, now what? So the other thing he said to me was, he said, Grant, I, I think there are people that are, are born to be speakers. He said, I think you are a, an entrepreneur who happens to be good at speaking. And that really stuck with me. And I was like, yeah, that really resonated because I love entrepreneurship. I was the, the teenager who was mowing yards throughout the neighborhood, who was doing anything to make a buck. I was selling random crap on eBay, just like constantly hustling, you know? So when I was doing the speaking, speaking was fun, but again, it was, a, it was a job. And so when he kind of, he framed that for me, it was like, I, you don't have a, you don't have a business, you have a job. And I was like, ah, okay. And it was again, kind of this like light bulb aha moment. So then it was kind of a matter of like looking for like, well, if I was going to have a business teaching this, like, what would that look like? And so looking for other examples of, of people who are a step or two ahead, not light years ahead, but a step or two of like, okay, I can, I can conceive of myself doing that. I can, I can understand what that would look like and how that would play out. Uh, and so that's, that's where I started when I was doing like some speaking and coach or some primarily some coaching around speaking. That's when um, I started to be really, really intentional about, okay, if we were going to do this and go all in on this and double down on this, like, what would that look like? And how would that play out? And what would I need to make that happen? And really beginning with the end in mind of um, being intentional about how we were going to go about doing it and how we were going to build it. And so if we go to this day, talk to us about where does the speaker lab business, where does your business or businesses um, where is it today? How, like, if you give me some context as to what are you doing? How many people on the team? What is your, what does your business look like 2022? 
Yeah, good question. So we've got we've got around 26, 27 team members. Um, the majority of them are, are full time employees. We're a completely virtual company. Uh, we have people all over the, the US. I'm in the Nashville area. We've got I think one or two other people here locally, but everybody's in the all over the place. Um, and so we, we do a mix of, of group and one on one coaching and training programs for speakers. So people who just say, Hey, I want to be a speaker. What what do I do? And so uh, there's a, a variety of things that we do in terms of helping speakers with their website and demo videos and helping them find leads. And uh, a lot of just like the coaching and support that they need and the training of here's the steps you need to take. And here's the process you need to follow to consistently find and book gigs. And again, it's that stuff that I wish I had when the, when, when I got started and maybe you were in a, a similar spot. Uh, and so that's the core of what we do today. And one thing I've, I've learned is that there's, there's no shortage of people who are interested in speaking. And it's something that it's a very, very aspirational type of thing. And there's people who want to speak full time and some people who'd want to do it on the side. So, uh, and everything in between. Uh, and then when the pandemic happened, it created virtual opportunities that largely didn't previously exist. And so just there's massive opportunities um, within the speaking industry today, just kind of to, to teach that. So um, yeah, so we've got, uh, again, mid upper twenties in terms of, of head count. Um, we'll do close to eight figures uh, this year in the business. Um, and uh, yeah, we've had pretty significant growth year over year. Tell me about um, the early hires when you, when, who were some of the early people you brought on? It's just you, you've got the idea. Is, is it, is it, did you hire an executive assistant? Did you hire an operations person? Did you first hire the coach? And I realize this is going to be different for everybody's business. So I'm, but I'm really interested in your journey here of the first, like, let's call it five or 10 people. Yeah. Um, what did that look like? Yeah, I, I think, um, let me kind of paint a picture of where we are today, just in terms of like leadership structure, and then we can kind yeah. of back into that. Perfect. And so today, um, uh, it's myself and four other directors, and we kind of make up the, the leadership team of the company. So uh, I'm more like a CEO uh, type of role. And then we have our director of sales, a director of marketing, a director of student success, who does all of our leads, our like coaching team, and then a director of operations. And so underneath each of them, so those are my four direct reports, and that's it. And so I work with them on a daily basis of what do they need? And then they are leading their own teams. And so then to kind of like reverse engineer, figuring out, okay, how do, how do we get to this point? So when we first started the business, it was largely a, a course. And so it was a the typical model of creating a course, you know, it was a quality, good course. Uh, and then it was sold primarily through webinars. And so one thing I was really intentional about early on is um, I... Uh, especially when it comes to webinars and courses, the two models are more of like an evergreen or more of a launch based model. And I was definitely more interested in, in evergreen in the sense that uh, I understood the, the launch model, but it's just seemed like, man, you're putting so many eggs in that basket that if you're launching this offer and you're quote unquote opening cart, you know, once or twice a year and something goes wrong, like, boy, that is just incredible amount of pressure. I would rather have a couple of sales every day than have a whole ton of sales, you know, twice a year. Like that just seemed like way too much pressure. So that was one thing. It's just being intentional of, I don't want massive, you know, uh, ebbs and flows with cash flow. I want to be really just a consistent, steady moving train. Like that's what I want to do. We're not trying to, um, uh, we're also not trying to um, be some big um, uh, tech company. We're not trying to IPO. Uh, we're not trying to uh, take on outside investments or funding. I own 100% of the business. We don't have any plans of selling or taking on you know, debt or, or venture funding or anything like that. And so, uh, so early on, because it was just primarily a course, then it's just a matter of like, okay, what are the levers that sell a course? Or what are the things that I can do? What are the things I need help? The big thing I needed help with early on was tech. And so hired someone who primarily owned like helping with emails and helping with the webinar software and helping with the shopping cart system and making sure that when someone, you know, purchased that then they got access to the course and that the course was set up. And so it was a lot of just like making sure all the tools play nicely together and making sure that they all cooperate. And when you push this domino that all the other corresponding dominoes are lined up and fall into place. And so that no, was a no, big quick. Real yeah. quick on that, I just want to clarify. Are, so you're you've got some tech help, but are you writing all the copy, doing all the creative? You're making the the business decisions. How does yeah. this look when it comes to sales and so on? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so especially early on, you are you're in the weeds. You're doing everything, and so eventually, as you get people, then you're you're further and further uh, out of the weeds and into the clouds, so to speak, and kind of looking at the the big picture of of the business. And so. Um, 
yeah, so early on, it was just, it was a lot of like the, the tech help. And then um, I think we hired like a, a part-time um, customer service, you know, who could just help with the inbox. And um, so that was a big thing that they were, they were helping with. Uh, a big thing that really think about is uh, what kind of business do you want to build and what do you want your role in that to be? Okay. And so I'll give you some examples just off the top of my head here. I was really intentional on, I don't want to be the bottleneck and I don't want to be the face of the business. Okay. Uh, and so I don't, I tell the team regularly, even today, this is not the grant show. I recognize that like I'm the mouthpiece in a lot of situations. I host the podcast. Um, I have done webinars. I, my name is on the cover of the book yada, yada, yada. But um, it's not the grant show. And so when I talk about the company, I, I, uh, I rarely, if ever, will talk about it in terms of mine, my, I, it's always we, us, our, we're all, we're all a part of this company and what it is that we're doing. Uh, and so I try to be really, really intentional with that and just making sure that the team knows, like, we're not trying to like build, I'm not trying to build a personal brand. Like that doesn't, that doesn't do anything for me. I'm completely comfortable going into a room and having nobody know who I am. I'm, prefer that. And so that was one thing just really intentional about as we started hiring, like what, what do we need? Uh, and what does my role need to be in this? Um, and so, so we did the course thing for a couple of years and it went well and it would continue to grow. It's a, it's a very scalable way to go about doing things. Uh, and then we, we had a lot of people who were asking about coaching and like, Hey, can you do coaching? Is that something you're interested in? And I personally wasn't really interested in coaching. I didn't from the standpoint of, uh, one, I don't feel like I'm a great coach. And two, I, again, I just didn't want to be the bottleneck. I didn't want to be like, yeah, this whole business is built upon grant coaching. Cause that doesn't, that doesn't work. And so we started doing some group coaching, but it was more of like a higher ticket thing uh, that the course at the time was sold for, you know, a thousand dollars or less. And the group coaching was going to be sold for a couple thousand dollars. And so I'd, I'd seen some people who were, were selling over the phone and more of a phone sales type model. Well, that's just a, a different, it's a different model. It's a different skill set. Uh, and so I, I found a guy who I think through some like referrals and relationships, um, he was doing a lot of coaching with sales teams. And so hired him uh, just, just completely as a contractor on the side. Hey, can you just write some like scripts for us? If we were, if we we're going to hire someone who could be on the phone and talk to someone else and get them to give, you know, several thousand dollars, like what, what do we even need? And so worked with him for a little while. And so he, he was helping with that. Uh, then quickly realized like there's only so much uh, coaching that I can do. So hiring like a, a part-time coach. And so you're really, you're kind of like, as the business is growing, like what are the bottlenecks? And then oftentimes it is people that you need to help solve that and to help eliminate and remove that. Yeah. Um, and I'd give on, on that note, by the way, with hiring, are you, you just said that you hired that person through the relationships that you might've had, like it mm -hmm. sourced from within. Yeah. Is that common for you? Like most of your hires been because of your network or is it you're great at writing ads and putting them on LinkedIn and, I'll give you a couple ways that we find um, uh, uh, team members today. Um, one is through not just my network, but kind of team members networks, but yeah. uh, especially me, like it's definitely on my radar. So I'll give you an example to, that happened literally today. Uh, I'm hooked on, as you know, I'm hooked on pickleball right now. I play a lot of pickleball every <laughs> yeah. week. And so I played for a couple hours this morning, 5.30 a.m., me and three other guys. And so one of the guys is a guy I played with several times. I didn't know him that well. And so we're talking a little, little bit and he's like, I hey, hear, you know, um, here's what I do. And I'm kind of considering looking for something else. Well, it's been on my radar of this role that we're potentially hiring for in the next month or two. So I started a conversation with him as like, Hey, here's this thing that we may or may not have in the next couple of months. And he's like, I'm totally interested. So then I'm pinging our sales director this morning. of just like, Hey, talk to this guy playing pickleball. Here's a potential lead and option. He's like, absolutely. would love to talk to him. Right. So some of it is just having it on your radar of what you're looking for totally. and what it is that you need. And then, you know, there's times where maybe you stumble across someone playing pickleball, but then there's other times where uh, I'm, I've reached out to you before of just like, Hey, here's what we're looking for. Do you know of anyone, anyone yeah. I should talk to? Uh, and you know, you, you, people oftentimes want to help, but they don't know where to help if you don't tell them. So exactly. being clear on what it is that you're looking for uh, and what that, what that role could look like. And it doesn't always have to be a, a full-time thing. Like we're at a point now where, um, you know, we, the majority of our team is full-time employees, but that hasn't always been the case. So for example, I mean, we didn't hire our first full-time employee until uh, two and a half years ago. And so we were doing 
like multiple seven figures and we didn't have any employees and it, like everybody was just wow. a contractor like some of them were full-time contractors some of them were part-time contractors um but it was just a mix of contractors and then quickly realizing like i guess we're supposed to have employees like I, and i don't that was a world like i didn't know um and so uh, uh so i think there's like the intentionality of like kind of working with what you've got and and making it work and then um uh, oh, the other thing I was going to say in terms of like sourcing was just our own audience. And so as our audience has grown, our email list, when we're looking for a role, yeah. like we'll put it out to the audience because that's for the most part, people who already know, like, and trust us, they're familiar with us. Oh, I think it'd be really cool to work with the speaker lab. And I've been following you guys for a couple of years. And so um, we get a lot of leads from uh, just from the audience. It also kind of depends on the nature of the role. So if we were looking for, let's say we're looking for a sales rep, um, then we might just start with our audience. But let's say we were looking for, um, recently we hired a, um, a paid media a specialist and someone who's just going to own our and run our Facebook ads and other paid media. That's more of like a specialized role. And so that's where like, we're really going to tap more into networks or specialized job boards um, that may or may not necessarily like those people may or may not exist within our ecosystem or audience. So I think just like having an awareness and talking with your own network has definitely made a big difference for us. Yeah, that's huge. I want to, I, there's a lot more to unpack around the business itself. I mean, I've realized that's hours, days, months, and, and ultimately has been years, right, of the process. Um, but what I don't want to miss here is also the piece of your family, which is why you resonate with being a family man with a business, not a businessman with a family. So let's also weave that in here to the conversation of go back to the beginning if you will, and now walk us through the journey a little bit over the last, whatever, 10 years, let's say, um, or 15 of how, how present were you with your family along the way? And um, I, for context, I'm asking this somewhat selfishly too, because for me, when I was a new speaker, I was definitely like all in on speaking. I would say things to Tatiana, like we don't have any money. <laughs> like if I don't work 15 hours a day, like I can't cover the mortgage this month. And th that was my world. Then I developed some success, but I had also developed some addictions to work. Yeah. Those, those habits that once was like, I need to put food on the table were now just habits that didn't allowed me to not deal with <laughs> some of the stuff I didn't want to deal with as a dad. And I kind of hid at work for a little while until I didn't. And that's where front row dads began for me. That was a little bit of my journey. How about for you, man? What was it like, you know, how much time you were able to invest in your marriage and your kids? Because as I see it today, you do a really good job of spending time with your kids. Like I love watching the trips that you're taking and I love seeing the photos and the, and the, and hearing the stories of the Baldwin family and the adventures that you're on. So how do you keep family a priority? What did that look like? Yeah. I, mean, I think early on, you're right that you are, when you're building a business, whether that's as a speaker or whatever it is that you're trying to do, like, I, I think that there's oftentimes you're, you're going to be uh, working a little bit harder than maybe you would like. And so one thing I always try to ask myself is, um, is this a season or is this the way it is? Is this a season or is this the way it is? Meaning that, you know, when you are, let's say you're an accountant, uh, tax time, it's just busy, right? But it's not always like that. If you're in retail, uh, October, November, December, it's just busy, right? But then January, February, it slows down. And so, you know, you know understand, like as a speaker, there were times where like, it's just busy. You might have a, a three-week stretch where you're like, I'm gone for three nights. I'm home for a night. I'm gone for two nights. I'm home for a night. I'm gone for five nights. I'm home for two nights. And it's just like in, out, in, out, in, out. But then you might have like a, a six week stretch where you're just home and you know, your wife's like, do you have anything going on? Can you go somewhere, do something? And so the, it creates these big ebbs and flows, both in terms of like work, but also like you're talking about in cash flow. You'd have a month where you're just like, holy crap, I just made bank. Like my, I made my whole salary from my previous job. And then you might have a month where you're like, I, I got nothing. And there's just like, uh, historically for speakers, December is just dead. Like there's just nothing happening in December. And so if you can book any gig for any dollar amount, it's worth it. But it's just like, you, you just kind of like balance those ebbs and flows of the highs and lows. And so I think it was kind of the same um, when I started the speaker lab, because I'm speaking 70 gigs a year. And so I'm still doing that while 
creating a course and doing webinars and just trying to get this other thing off the ground. So you have like one plate spinning and you're trying to start the second plate, but you can't let go of the first plate while the second plate is getting going. And so for a little while, like there's always going to be that overlap when you're starting the new thing. Um, when I was starting speaking and you have like none gigs and you're trying to get that first gig, like you have to, you have to have one plate spinning in order just to pay the bills and to be able to eat and live indoors. And so I think like, again, it's, it's, there's going to be times where it's out of whack. And that's certainly been the case for me, but I think you just have to ask yourself, like, is this a season or is this the way it is? And so sometimes if I'm, if I'm talking with some, you know, entrepreneurs or something and they're like, yeah, it's been a season, but like, I couldn't tell you uh, when the season started and when the season's going to end. Well, at that point, like you really have to reevaluate. If you just know, like it, you know, it's going to be busy for the next couple of weeks or a couple of months, like I, I, it's a season I can ride that out. But if like, this is the way it is and there's no end in sight and there's nothing you're doing to, to change that that doesn't work. Um, and so I think that you absolutely have to have that intentionality there. And again, it, I don't know, man, it just, it, it feels cliche to say of, of just like, you know, you got to be intentional about it, but you do like, so there's things that are just like non-negotiables for me. Like I don't want to work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. I don't want to have an office. Like that's why we're a virtual company because I want to be home. Um, I take off a bunch of time during the year uh, to go on trips, you know, like you, you know, like we take a lot of trips, um, and it's not necessarily like anything like amazing or extravagant. Like we love going to the beach. We love going to Disney. Uh, we love little adventures here or there. Like we just, we love trips and adventures. And so I don't, then the business is going to be built based on that where Grant can travel, you know, a couple of times now we've done a sabbatical where I've taken an entire month offline off of the business and just like, we're going to build the business so that I can do that. And so like, I think again, just the intentionality of going, um, let's play this out. If we built the business this way and it got really, really big, is that the kind of life that you want? Um, or if you do this one thing and it leads to X, like, is that what you're going for? Is that what you're trying to accomplish? And if it's not, then get off of that path. And so there's several things that I know, like right now that we do, um, where we're leaving money on the table that we could be doing. That's just low hanging fruit. Like I know I could charge a lot for one-on-one -on -one coaching. I just don't want to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I, I just don't. I know we could charge a lot to do like masterminds and things that are like dependent on me. I just don't want to do that. Like that's just not intriguing. That's not interesting to me because I don't want to be the bottleneck. Um, and so I think there's like massive amounts of intentionality of like, what kind of business do you want to have? I don't want to do coaching calls. I don't want to do sales calls. And so that means if we're going to do those things, then someone's got to do that. And so finding those people who can, you know, who can lead that or, or can, can own that, that part of the business. What have you learned to say no to that was particularly difficult over the years? I think a, a big challenge even today is just, there's no shortage of opportunities. Like there's just no shortage of things that you could do. And I think it's so difficult for an entrepreneur to just not bounce from shiny object to shiny object because they're all good. Like they could all work. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I remember several years ago, um, I was really interested in real estate investing. I didn't know anything about it. I was just new to it, was wanting to um, dig into real estate investing. And so there's a friend of mine who done a ton of real estate investing. And I remember asking him, I said, okay, man, I'm interested in real estate investing. You have all these different types of real estate investing. You have single family home and multifamily home and um, uh, short-term rentals and Airbnb and raw land and commercial properties and on and on the list goes. And I said, which one is best? And he said, yes. And I was like, that's not helpful. I was like, what, is, what does that mean? You know, he's like, they all work. What you don't find is someone doing all of them. And so like, that's really stuck with me because that's true with any entrepreneur, right? So right now with what we do within the speaker lab, there are opportunities who, uh, like a lot of different ways that we could go about helping people. Um, you know, what if we, uh, you know, what if I did one-on-one -on -one coaching? What if we hired, what if we did offer just one-on-one -on -one coaching with anybody? What if we did masterminds? What if we did live events? Live events would be great for speakers. Why don't you do a live event? We've never done a live event because I just don't want to. Uh, what about if you guys did, uh, I don't know. I mean, you, uh, there's people who are interested in speaking are also interested in writing a book or doing courses or doing coaching or doing consulting or doing a podcast. You should, you should teach that. It's like, Oh yeah, we should teach that. But like, I just, I, the, like the best thing that we can do is like, we do one thing and we do that one thing really well. So we tell our speakers, 
you want to be the steakhouse and not the buffet, the steakhouse, not the buffet. Meaning, John, if you and I were looking for a good steak, like we could go to a buffet where steak is one of a hundred things that they offer and they're all mediocre, or you could go to a steakhouse where they do one thing, but they do that one thing. Well, they don't do seafood. They don't do tacos. They don't do pasta. They do steak. And so I'm really intentional for us as a business to just say, we're a steakhouse. And I love tacos, but we don't make tacos here. We make steak. And if you like, you don't like steak, that's fine. Cause there's plenty of other places that make pasta. That's there's a great pasta place down the street. And let me tell you about them and you need to go work with them. That's fine. That does, that's, that's not a problem at all. But I think just the intentionality, just in terms of focus and just saying like, no, no, we do this. No, 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 that's, that's good. That's shiny. I love it. I'm intrigued. We do this. This is what we do. And so I think that, that, um, I think a big part of our success is just like we've been in the speaking industry doing one thing for an extended period of time. And so it's not like, oh, Grant, what's he up to now? Oh, I thought he was doing real estate. I thought he was doing manufacturing. I thought he was doing right. Amazon. You know, it's like, no, no, he, he's he been in the speaking business doing the same thing, offering the same dang product for an extended period of time. Yeah. When you look at all the people that you know that are business owners and CEOs, do you think that's a common thread of like, it's not their ability to say yes and generate ideas, which many of them are good at that. There's visionaries who are endless ideas. I mean, I'm definitely in the camp of like overwhelming my team with good ideas. Do you think that the common thread though is their ability to pick a lane, stay in their lane? And of course, granted, this is all in context because sometimes you have to switch lanes, right? An industry that might be dying and you have to go with the changing times. But in general, do you think that's, a thread that you see amongst all these CEOs and business owners is their ability to say, no, I don't want to do the mastermind, even though somebody's like, you could make so much money doing a mastermind. And you're like, yeah, but that's not, it doesn't fit these principles that we have, right? These yeah. values, these defined boundaries that we have, these defined, this is my zone of genius, or this is where I stay. I don't get involved in other things. These are the four people that report to me. I don't report not, I don't want to get involved with every team member on, you know, is that it? Is that a common thread? Their ability to minimize, simplify, focus? Yeah, I think we have a very, very simple business. And like, we don't want to make it complicated. I don't want to offer 10 different products. You know, I don't want to have a whole bunch of different SKUs, you know? And again, there's just, there's no shortage of things that we could do, but just saying like, no, no, we do this. Like we are a steakhouse and that is it. And so some of it is me telling myself that some of it is telling our team that I just reminding them like, yeah, those are all great ideas. And yeah, we could totally do those things. Uh, one other thing I think is really important in terms of like the growth of the business. That's been a big thing is uh, the uh, is hiring really good people and letting them own parts of the business. Okay. And not from like a, an equity standpoint, but just like in terms of decision-making. Okay. So um, it, it's kind of, um, I'll give a couple of thoughts on this. Like I remember early on when we first started like hiring some people, just part-time contractors that my hesitation was, I don't want to hire people because I don't want to manage people. I didn't feel like I was great at it. Like I like people, I like working with people, but I don't, you know, I don't want to, my, I don't want to manage people. I didn't really know what that would look like even. And so it was just kind of a, a limiting belief. What I have found though, is that um, it's counterintuitive, but the more people we have, uh, and having the right people, which is a huge, huge caveat there, the more people we've had, the easier things have got for me because there's just fewer things I own. There's fewer things I got to do. There are days where I'm just like, I'm not sure what I need to be doing today. Cause it used to be like, I got to write an email. I got to prepare for this webinar. I got to work on the slides. I got to do this. I got this meeting. I got, I got to, I got to run this meeting. And now like it, it just, um, I was talking with a, a mutual friend of ours who just spent some time with Richard Branson. And uh, I asked him, I was like, what was the big aha, uh -huh, the big takeaway? And he said, the big thing that Branson kept saying was hire great people and get out of the way. And I think there's just so much truth to that. So within our business, we have three core values and one of them is ownership. And so it's just, when I come back to, this is not the grant show. And so what would you do in this situation? And 99% of the time, we're going to go with that. There, there was the, this morning, um, I messaged uh, our marketing director. I was like, hey, here's a cool funnel idea that I saw. And I was like, I think we could totally do this. And I was like, I'm just putting it on your radar. If you need anything, let me know. And it's not like, hey, man, you need to do this. And I want you to have it done by the end of the week and drop everything else that you're doing and make it happen. It was you're a very smart marketer. So here's something I thought could help you. If you want to do this, cool. If we never do this again, that's fine with me too. 
but I pay you really well. So I don't have to think about it. Cause like you, I don't, I don't need you just to be a, um, uh, an opera, like a, a task person. Like, I don't want to be the one that goes up the mountaintop and like tries to figure out the latest and greatest marketing strategies. And then comes down and says, okay, I need you just do a, B and C. I, I want you, I want to set like, Hey, here's the destination, whatever you think is the best possible way for us to get there. Let's do that. And so hiring really good people. Um, and the other part I would say with that, with hiring great people is to compensate them accordingly. And so there, uh, the majority of our team has some form of variable comp that when the company does well, they do well. And so they're incentivized uh, based on their role, what it is that they're doing to do well because they make more. And so there's, again, when we talk about like a level of ownership, uh, I don't want my, if I bust my butt, I don't want to feel like, oh, I'm, I'm I made the same amount. And if we suck this month, I made the same amount. No, I want you to have the ability to make more because you help generate more for the company. Uh, and so I think that that, like having a comp plan that incentivizes that uh, goes a long way as well. How do you, let's say there's a guy listening. It's like, I wave my hand. <laughs> let's say there's a guy listening and maybe he's the guy on the other end of the mic right now, looking at you on the screen. <laughs> and and he's wondering, how do you develop the comp plan? You hear that idea. You're like, that's a great idea, man. I've got a couple of employees. I want to do a comp plan. And then the next question is, how the hell do I come up with a comp plan? Oh, that sounds like way too complicated. I've got 30 things I got to do today. Where do I even find the time to come up with a comp plan? And of course, it's like, well, give it to your COO. But yeah, I don't have a COO yet. How, what are those initial... How, how do you, what would you advise somebody in that space? I'll give an example. Yeah, I can tell you. Um, so one of the things that we do with certain team members is we do a profit share. And so the profit share is um, based upon uh, when we hit like certain revenue targets, we do this on a quarterly basis. When you, when we hit revenue targets, then there's like a, a tiered system um, uh, of how much profit they would make. Okay. So uh, we're incentivizing basically both top line and bottom line. All right. So let me give you some like actual numbers here. Um, and that'll, I think that'll help. So if let's say for round numbers, um, if we hit $100,000 in revenue in, uh, in a quarter, then you get 1% of profit. If we hit 200,000 uh, in revenue, you get 1.5% of profit, you know, and on up to whatever it is that you're comfortable with. And you got to like do the math. I'm like, okay, let's play this out and see how this, how this does here. Um, because if you offer, you know, too many pieces of the pie to too many people, all of a sudden you're like, oh, dang, the pie just got really small for me. And did you um, outsource that? Did you hire a CFO or a bookkeeper to look at those numbers mm -hmm. for you? No, no. So I did the, those early versions and, um, and just kind of like ransom, like rough back of the napkin math uh, of just like, hey, let's let's do this. And so, so like in those cases, um, like again, they're incentivized by the profit. Meaning, like right. if we have a huge revenue but we don't have any profit, you, there's no profit to share. And so, uh, whereas like if you're like, well, we're not going to spend anything and we're going to have huge profit, but we didn't uh, huge profit percentage, but we didn't grow the bottom line, and like you're going to get a big percent, but it's a small number. And so they're incentivized to do both. And so that structure we've kept for uh, several years um, with several of our, our, of our key team members. I, I would also say like when it comes to comp plans, like give yourself, and I would think, I think I communicate this to team members too, like flexibility to evolve and change. Like this is what works today. We're going to reevaluate this in a year. Uh, and what I always communicate is I don't want you to take a step backwards but uh, I also want to make sure this is a, a win for both of us. And because there, there's times where it's gotten out of alignment, like, man, you're making bank right now. And sometimes they're just like, yeah, this is like a good setup. Um, and if they've done something that generates bank for them and it makes sense, like, yeah, then keep doing that. But if something just feels out of whack, you know, I, I think that there's kind of like a, like almost an internal gut check of like, does this feel weird? You know, like there's times where you're paying someone and you're like, okay, here's what I'm paying. Here's what I'm getting. And like, does this feel weird? Um, and, and for one way or, the, or another, meaning like uh, it feels weird, like you feel like you're overpaying for what you're getting or you're way underpaying for what you're getting. Like, does this, does this feel weird? So give yourself some grace of like, it may, you know, you may do it, need to change that. It may, the comp plan may work this year and it may not make sense next year. Well, here's my question, Grant. We've got three minutes and I've got 13 questions. <laughs> we need to do part two, man. <laughs> Well, I, and I like, honestly, like I love this topic because, um, 
entrepreneurship is fun, but it's no fun. If you, if you're dropping the ball as a husband or as a dad, like then you're yeah. just, you're doing it wrong. And so it, it, the business should support your life. Um, not the other way around. And so I, I want to build it in a way where I can take a sabbatical, where I can take a lot of vacations, where I can play pickleball regularly, where I can spend a ton of time with the family. Uh, like, and so you have to just begin with that end in mind of what it is that you're, what you want life to look like. And then if there's a business activity or decision that is counter to what it is that you're trying to do, then you can't do it, or you have to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, that makes more sense. So you have to just be super, super intentional about those things. And again, man, it sounds so elementary, but like, that's, that's a big reason. Like we've made so many of the decisions that we've made with the business. Yeah. Well, dude, thank you for the chat. I, I had been looking forward to this and um, very insightful for me. And I, I hope it helps many other guys. Some of my favorite little pieces that uh, are, are, are maybe tiny statements, but I can already feel them having a big impact in my life. I love the question, is this a season or is it the way that it is? Um, I love how you talked about just hiring A players and then giving them ownership and getting out of the way. I love the idea of profit sharing, whether that's, um, there's lots of ways to look at profits and probably a lots of ways to approach that, but involving them in the success of your team. These are things that are easy to say um, easy to write down in notes and then easy not to execute on. But I'm, I'm really taking a look at these as it relates to my business. And I imagine that other people will be doing the same thing. The challenge of really asking yourself, have you created a business or a job for yourself? Mm -hmm. I think is really good. Even the open cart or, you know, like the, the, all the pressure being on one moment versus like, where can you relieve pressure in your life? Cause I feel like so much of my business, when I create a business that puts so much pressure on me, it's hard to then show back up to my family and be like ready to explode because I have so much pressure on me. So it's not even that I need better parenting strategies per se. I need to relieve some pressure at work right. to let my natural parenting abilities show up. So they're not drowned out by the intense emotions created during my, my work day. Um, and just the, I think that what I also find is the principles that guide you. So much of this is knowing who you are, knowing what you want, knowing what you don't want, and then having the courage to live into that. Um, been a great conversation, as it always is. Can I give one other quick thing? Anything you want, man. Yeah. I, I think the other thing with um, as you hire people, and again, I think people are like the linchpin of what can can really grow and build a, a business. But just take really good care of people like actually just give a damn and like really like care about them. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, we, I realized the other day, I shared this with the team. Again, we've got, you know, 20 something people on the team. We haven't had anyone leave in the past year. We've had zero turnover in a, in a full year. And I, I was telling the team, I was like, that's not normal. Like that doesn't just happen. But like, we've been so intentional about our culture, especially for a virtual company of like, you're not going to an office. You're not seeing these people on a daily basis. You're not rubbing shoulders with them. Your families aren't meeting. You're not, you know, going out for drinks on Friday after work or whatever. Like you have to be super intentional. So I think building a culture that if people are the most valuable asset and resource to a business and finding good people is really hard and keeping people is really good, is really hard. Then I always tell the team, like, I want this to be the best place that you ever work. Because there's a good chance you're going to do other things in your career. I don't expect that everybody's going to be here forever. But while you're here, I want to make it really hard for you to leave. Not in a manipulative way, but just that like, dang, the grass isn't greener over there. Like the grass is green, like really lush and green here. Like, why would I leave? Like, I, this is amazing. I have freedom. I have flexibility. I have autonomy. My, my uh, team doesn't uh, micromanage me. They don't babysit me. They give me a ton of flexibility. We have, we have a guy who uh, spent the past six months living out on an RV and he and his family were traveling around. I was like, man, as long as you get your work done, I don't care where you are. As long as you have good internet, whatever you need to do to get your stuff done. Uh, he's like, Oh, like, and so for the past six months, they've been like bouncing around. He's like, this was a completely game changing. And so just treating people like adults, like you do your work and you can have a ton of freedom and flexibility and autonomy. That's great with us. And we're not going to tell you how to do your work or where you do your work. Like you're an adult. We have a guy who's in Hawaii right now. And he, he got up yesterday at 4 a.m. local time to be on a call. And I was like, man, you're in Hawaii. That's awesome. But a guy who uh, spent several months in Africa with his, uh, his wife's family last year who are missionaries, he's like, can I go to Africa to work for a couple of months? Like, 
yeah, man, if you can figure out the time zones and you can still show up for things I need you to be at, like, that doesn't bother me. He did great. It was awesome. But just like, again, the point being like, when you have good people, like just take really good care of them. And sometimes it's the big things like your, their comp plan. And sometimes it's just the little things of just like checking in with them. So one thing, like small thing I do is on a quarterly basis, I do a 15 minute one-on-one -on -one with everybody in the company. And there's no business agenda. Like I just did one with someone who joined the team a couple months ago and he was kind of like, I'm meeting with the CEO and like, am I in trouble? I was like, no, man, I just, I don't have anything business work related to discuss. I'm just like, I wanted to chat with you a little bit more and like, how's things going? Is there anything you need from me? How's your, how's your wife? I know you got married a couple months ago and uh, just like shooting the breeze and like just caring about people, like makes such a huge difference versus feeling like, how do I find a next cog in my, in the plug into my wheel or into my system that can do something and make me more money? Like you like, that's, that's not going to work. And I've done that before. Like I've made the mistake. But, but like building a company culture that people really genuinely care about and know that they are cared about goes such a long way. Grant, I love you, my friend. Thank you so much for this. Um, imagine many other great conversations in our future. I'll let you get back to your day right now, but uh, yeah, part two, three, five, ten, 10, all to be had in the future, man. Thank you. Thanks for being a great example. Thanks for opening up and sharing with us a little bit about your journey. I learned a lot about you today, which is a, a big intention of this conversation. And I can't wait for other guys to learn about you too. So uh, thanks, my friend. And real quick, uh, in case there's somebody listening and they're like, I or somebody I know wants to get into the speaking business, uh, is it thespeakerlab.com? Yep. Yep. Thespeakerlab.com. Everything we do is over there. Got a podcast by the same name, the Speaker Lab podcast, over 400 episodes. Uh, so plenty of resources and Oh, yeah. I can help. Guys, you could go listen to my uh, me talk about my speaking journey. Yeah, uh, we got a couple Andre's episodes with show. you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah and they're they're right. a few years old at that. this point, but yeah, we can go back in the archives for those. Forgot about that. All right, Grant. Thanks, man. Thanks, brother.